Steve Kennedy is definitely uh, out of the ordinary. He lived in a, in a tent. It wasn't even a camper. It was, a, I mean, they, he and uh, Julia would set up a, a, a cloth tent and he was fishing the FLW Tour out of an aluminum bass tracker. He uses that natural raw fishing ability and that sixth sense to solve the puzzle. And this game's all about solving the puzzle and he's one of the best out here. That's when I knew that Steve Kennedy wasn't out here for the glitz and glamour. Steve Kennedy's out here because he loves to catch a bass. His talent as a fisherman is just phenomenal, and I know he gets a lot of that from Ben. When conditions are changing fast and, and, and plans are going out the window, that's when Steve is really at his best. This is J and M bookstore. This is J and M bookstore. It's a tiger of a bookstore, <laughs> <laughs> and he's a tiger of a fisherman. I understand too. Do you uh, do you remember Ray when he was working here? Yes. One of y'all remember. Yeah. yeah, I remember a little bit. Yeah. Ray can Scott. Tell, yeah. Can you tell him a story? And he, Ray, Ray Scott worked here. He worked in the window for my dad here. He he uh, got on the microphones and hollered for people to come in here in the fifties when he was in college, stuff like that. Uh, he loves. He comes back even to J and M bookstore. Sticks his head in here. He's got his cowboy hat on. All that stuff. It's <laughs> crazy. Wear, no, wear, I love it. Did he wear a cowboy hat back then? No, I don't think so. But I didn't know it. Yeah, we got a big forty foot motor. Yeah, we got eight months out of the year probably. That's cool. So this is where you get the hats. Yeah. So this is where the Steve Kennedy Auburn hat is. This is it. Yeah. This is the one I like. The most. I've been trying to wear one more like this. Actually, I think that's it. No more. So this is where you buy all the hats. Right. And then you gotta lay it out in the hood of the truck for about six months to fade it a little bit so it looks... So you pre-fade your hat? <laughs> oh, anyway, I have a bunch of them, but yeah, I, I'll have several of them laid out in the truck for months. What to makes get them, them right? Like them. What, makes, what do you like about what makes just, a good Auburn hat? It just, you know, it just... It just fits. It feels right. I don't know. <laughs> but that's this is the hat. This is the one I've won for years. There used to be a a khaki hat that everybody used to wear, and you can't get them anymore. It was like khaki color with just the blue letters, and uh, that's the one I wore for years and years and years. If you go back and look at all my BFL pictures, like similar to that. It's similar to that, but it doesn't have the orange. But, oh, okay. Uh, but everybody wore it, and uh, 
when I was in school here, and now then you can't find one. But, but yeah, if you look at all my old BFL pictures, that was the hat I was wearing. It's just the hat I've always worn. I mean, this in in the state of Alabama, we don't have any professional sports, so it's it's Alabama and Auburn, and uh, so yeah, it's just it's what matters around here, really. So, but. Uh, but honestly, if somebody paid me to write money, it'd come off. It just ain't happened. So uh, there were a lot of opportunities back, you know, 18 years ago, but uh, hadn't been all that good since, what, 07, 08, really, when everything crashed. There's not been a lot of opportunities with anybody. So. But yes, it, uh, I mean, the whole state is, is it's about football. <laughs> Oh. What? I don't know. Oh, there's people. Seriously? Who is that? He looks like you. You ever seen how they do a half court shot and <laughs> half time for whatever? And we, uh, when I was in school at Auburn, they used to draw a ticket number and get somebody to come down there at halftime to do a half court shot. I don't know what you want. But, uh, but the thing was, the students didn't have tickets, so we never got picked. So, uh, so one of the games, it was Georgia, Georgia game. So it's a pretty big game. I mean, even if we didn't do well in basketball, but. Uh, the guy got out there and he said, you know, the students are always complaining that we uh, we don't pick one of them. So I'm just going to pick one of them and come out here and they're going to do a, uh, what did they do, a free throw? They had to do a layup, a free throw, a three-pointer, and a half-court shot in 15 seconds, 20 seconds. And uh, But when he said, I'm going to pick one of the students, so we all jumped up, you know, yeah, pick me, pick me. That dude looked me dead in the eye. Um, I mean, we're sitting front row where we always sat, and uh, he looked me dead in the eye, and I sat down. And he said, I'll be you right there. So for, uh, you know, it didn't matter. I asked him, you know, does it matter what order we do them in, that kind of thing? And he's like, no, no. So I, I figured I'd do a free throw first, then do the layup, then come back around for the three-pointer. And we play basketball a lot, so I, I was decent anyway, but... Uh, but yeah, I lined up there at the uh, free throw line and shot an air ball, and that whole place echoed air ball. <laughs> and then I still had to run around for 15 or 20 seconds to take some more shots. I think I made my free uh, layup, and uh, I didn't make the three point. I don't think I made another shot after that. But uh, but I could still hear this place echoing air ball, air ball. <laughs> A BFL win. I mean, I've got the the trophy there. I just I don't know which one it is. <laughs> We're left, I won four in uh, in one year out of that bass tracker. In 2000, they went to that pro co format, and I didn't get into the first tournament as a non boater. I couldn't believe how I many non boaters decided to show up when they did that. But uh, so I had to take my boat as a uh, my aluminum boat as a boater, and then uh, 
once I had points. The, the second term of the year was at Lake Eufaula, and I actually drug my boat down there and practiced for it. And I went to the meeting, and they said, we can get you in as a boater and not a non-boater. So I, uh, I'm to remember thinking I can get, I think I can get my live wells working tonight, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, I ended up missing a check by a dead fish. I actually had enough weight. I never could even leave the creek where we launched. The wind was blowing so hard out on the big lake. But uh, so I, yeah, I just went fishing up in there, places I'd never even fished, and I uh, should have cast a check. But uh, at the end of the year, I won the super tournament on Neely Henry, which was the last platoon, so it's after that, but I won the Neely Henry Super Tournament. I won the Lake Seminole, which I think this is Lake Seminole, uh, the first tournament of the year in the Bulldog Division. And then I won the Super Tournament again at Neely Henry that fall. And then the very next weekend, I went over to the Bulldog Division over at Lake Sinclair, and I won the Super Tournament there, back-to-back -back weekends. <laughs> So I won four BFLs in one year's time. I mean, I've been fishing for a year and a half, I guess, as a pro or a boater, all out of that bass tracker. And uh, that's when I told my wife, I said, if I get in, I'm gonna fish, you know, FLW. But and the whole reason was because the, the co-anglers were filled. The co-anglers were filled. That's the only reason I ever took my boat. I mean, I, you know, obviously, I knew I could do it. I'd always said I wanted to do it. I knew I was there. I just. But yeah, that was the first time I ever got to make the decisions about where I'm going. I mean, even, you know, growing up, I was in the back of the boat with dad, but, but yeah, that was the first time I'd ever, I mean, we'd fished a few tournaments, you know, my brother and I would fish a few here and there, but, but basically we were fishing out of a 13 foot Boston whaler with a ice chest for a live well and a 20 horse. <laughs> Van Kitty displays the results of spooning. He was known as the Spoon Man. The local writer there in Macon called him the Spoon Man. Called him Spoon Man. He was amazed. That was one of, really one of the first guys to use a depth finder. I mean, really, really use it. And Martin was the place. You know, most of these other lakes back over in Georgia, you didn't have to fish that deep. Over here, you really compared to most places in the south, he had to fish pretty deep. So he was probably one of the first ones to use a flasher to find fish. And uh, man, we had all those places like on the lower end of Ufalo. I mean, we had all that to ourselves for 20 years kind of deal. I mean, guys would catch on eventually, but this is a copy of it. You need to read, this is it. This is the one I was saying you really need to read. The banks are for holding money, not bass. That's the quote. <laughs> That's the way I learned. Banks are for holding money, not bass. Goes to the bank with his tournament winnings. and cut his teeth on a fishing lure in Alabama and introduced the technique to middle Georgia anglers in the early 70s. Spoon fishing involves the use of a structure spoon, sometimes called a jigging spoon. Learned this technique from his peers at Lake Martin in Alabama. But yeah, you think of me as that junk fisherman swim bait guy and this is this is who I am. We just, I mean, typically we just don't get to do this anymore. You know what I mean? We don't have the, I mean, you don't have wintertime tournaments. The picture's on. It's got me in the picture. We're done. The work here is done. Top, top 
that picture's actually taken out there on the river out there. Probably this time of year because I got on my big shirt. He's really wearing a Daiwa hat. That's sad. I think I have on my Auburn hat though, don't I? That's not the orange one. That's that tan one I was talking about. Yeah, That's when he was back throwing that maxi R. We called it a maxi taxi. But yeah, that was that was the deal. And I actually fished my whole first season of FLW out of this thing. I fished, uh, I broke a lower unit at, at uh, Wheeler out there on the flats. And uh, so I took my other boat. I actually had bought a, excuse me, I bought a uh, 354 Ranger so I could enter FLW as a, as a Ranger owner. So I bought a used boat for 1500 bucks before we started fishing FLW. And uh, I had a 90 horse on it at the time. So I took that one day at, uh, at Lake Wheeler and then I took that Ranger up. When we went up to Champlain, I took the Ranger with the 90 on it. But yeah, every other day the first year was out of that Bass Tracker. I mean, I've been winning so much out of it. I wasn't really wanting to change anything. and. Uh, and then the second year, I guess Dad had bought a uh, a new motor for his boat, so he gave me the 150 off the back of his to put on that Ranger. So the second season, I fished out of that 354 with a 150, and then that's when I won Kentucky Lake was out of that little Ranger. There's advantages to each type of boat. There's, there, and obviously there's more than bass boats. I mean, there's flats boats, saltwater boats, and everything. They all have their place. And there's advantages and disadvantages to each one. There's too much emphasis on speed right now, I guess is the word. I just, a fast boat to me does not necessarily make a good fishing boat. And, you know, I was pretty content to run that little 519 with a 200 and uh, it's a pretty good fishing boat. But, but I mean, really you probably catch more fish out of a 150 size boat just because you're, it's a lighter, it displaces less water when you're around the fish and you know when you're out there in 20 40 feet of water or whatever it doesn't really matter but but you start getting up in those shallower areas just the displacement the weight of the boat is becomes an issue to me and uh, and then I always like the aluminum boats just for getting up there around rocks and what have you, you just don't have to worry about scratching it up beating it up and you know, I just, it's so much more relaxing. I mean, some of these guys are just, I mean, anal about their boats. I don't know another way to put it. Can you use that? <laughs> that's, that's about the way I see it. I mean, and they're at a huge disadvantage when it comes to competing. I mean, I'm certainly not that way. Even if I'm in a fiberglass boat, if, if scratching a boat up gets me an extra 10 grand, it's, it's gonna get scratched. I mean, it's, <laughs> It doesn't cost but a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars to refinish the bottom of the boat. <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> You know, all the guys around here, Jay Todd, I mean, every pro from this area has got an aluminum boat, you know, just, just for fun fishing. That's what you do on the weekends. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a disadvantage when you got to run 50 miles to compete. There's no question, but you know, it's, it's also an advantage when you can get up above some rocks that, you know, the guys in the fiberglass boats aren't willing to do, but the way it's been going lately, they just, bitch enough and get it bad. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it bad and, piss you off a, a little bit. I mean, piss, a, a little bit? Are you kidding me? 
that's that's my number one hot button it get me it's it's ridiculous that they're banning the little boats and allowing 250 horsepower i mean for years and years it was 150 max and uh i mean i don't even like being on the water with these guys with the 250s i mean they're they scare the crap out of me when they come by me i mean i mean obviously we're at blast off but they're coming by me at uh you know I swear they're uh, less than a boat length away, 20 feet away, and soaking you with their spray. And you feel like it's also like, kind of like the Steve Kennedy rule. <laughs> like with the, with the aluminum. I know. I know it, yes. Guys, but I mean, is it? I mean, is that? Yes. Like, it's I, kind of like personally. I don't have as obviously. I don't have as many rules as uh, you know a guy like Roland or Scott Martin. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, that does feel like a Steve Kennedy rule. I. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't understand the logic of banning the little boats. And growing up, we had a, uh, I don't have one out here now, but I'm gonna get one. I, we had a 13 foot, a 1963, 13 foot Boston whaler. And uh, that was the boat that mom and dad would let us take out. It had a, you know, a 20 horse tiller on it. And, uh, you know, they'd, they'd put us out in a boat when we were 12, 13 years old. and. I mean, we lived out of that little boat. Just, that's the most fun memories I have as a kid. <laughs> and, but yeah, I just, I feel like I'm in a barge when I'm in one of these bass boats. And, uh, and I really feel like it's a disadvantage when you're fishing. I mean, you don't realize how much water one of these boats displaces. If you've ever, uh, if you've ever been on like the Arkansas River when a barge comes through and seen the current, where we're going. It, and seeing the current that comes around those wing dams when they're going up in a, going up the river, you get the same effect when you're coming around a dock or, you know, especially when you get up in these shallower creeks. Those fish know you're there just because the water's moving. A lighter, a smaller, lighter boat is an advantage when you're fishing. Yeah, we have to have a route. That's that's part of it. The rules say we have to have a a boat route. And uh, but uh, the uh, Konami brand went away this year or last year for reasons I'm not fully aware of. But uh, so yeah, we had to come up with a boat wrap, and uh, we've uh, Julia's always wanted to do a tiger kind of deal, but. But I was looking for something more camouflaged, I guess. To, uh, just trying to imagine what a fish sees looking up on the sky. You know, you got sky blue and then greens, grays, whatever. So, uh, but basically, it's just trying to break up the profile of the boat. And uh, that video you you were talking about it earlier. The uh, not earlier, but earlier this year you were talking about that video where that fish bit me with no line out and i mean that to me is where that boat comes becomes an advantage it uh that fish bit me with you know that much line out and the boat the bait had been sitting there for a long time and so uh if you start uh some of these more uh what's the word gaudier boat wraps <laughs> I don't think they would have caught that fish. And uh, you don't realize our whole season is all about one fish here, one fish there. I mean, you, you pick up a four or five pounder, that makes all the difference. That gets you in the cuts, that gets you in the classic. I mean, we're, most of these places we go, everybody catches a limit. It's just, it's about one good quality fish, two good quality fish. You get one each day, one big one each day, and you're in the cut. I mean, so, uh, Anyway, I was pretty happy with the way the wrap turned out. It, uh, a lot of people don't get the blue tiger, but it's basically a sky blue. And then you can also see how the light's kind of filtering through the trees on the on it. It just, it really breaks it up. It looks cool right there, doesn't it? I think it does. I really like it. <laughs> you had that hat on him. Esther, are you dealing in? Mommy, who's in? Yeah. 
This is probably not all of them. These are just the ones we've managed to find in boxes and everything and get up on the wall. But uh, We had a uh, pedigree for a while. They, I mean, they covered entry fees and then some. It was a good deal. But, uh, but the problem with that, with FLW, when I qualified for the elites, they wouldn't let me fish. You know, everybody, everybody had, uh, up until that point, everybody had been fishing both tours and you know, that was the year when they came out with a series and whatnot. So uh, basically they told me I couldn't fish something that I'd spent my entire life trying to qualify for. So, so I ended up turning down that FLW team deal to go fish both tours. They basically will make Julia drive the RV and then I'd have to buy the truck and the boat behind it. We bought that double stack and we were planning on putting the uh, boat on and then the truck underneath it and they would not let us tow the truck to the event. So, uh, so that's why I ended up turning down Toyota. And then since then, there really hadn't been all that many sponsors come in, new sponsors, but uh, so it wasn't, so, didn't have anything to do with, I don't want a sponsorship. No, it has to nothing to do with that. It, it just, comfort, I mean. it just, yeah, up to that point, we'd always traveled together and uh, it, their truck would not carry a truck camper, which is the way we had done prior to that. So we actually bought the RV with the intent of having a Toyota behind it. And they basically told us we had to drive two vehicles and, uh, and now, I mean, you're talking about regrets. Now we're actually driving two vehicles. I've been for a couple of years. And so, yeah, there are some regrets there. You know, back then we had opportunities. I mean, we did pedigree, but we had opportunities with Everstar, Kellogg. I mean, you know, they were, they were coming along pretty regular. Plus we're winning, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 a year just in tournament winnings. The, my sponsorship money was insignificant compared to what I was winning at the time. But, but since that time, Bass has cut the payouts. The FLW, they've cut the payouts incredibly. And then the, you know, the sponsorship opportunities have not come up like they used to. So, uh, but yeah, at this point I've not, you know, had them for so long. I'm not even sure I would get an opportunity if one did come up. So, uh, that sucks. <laughs> it really sucks. Basically, I switched over to Yamaha for nothing, zip, zero, nada. And uh, so, yeah, then, then, you know, I won three, four hundred thousand dollars. But, yeah, they wouldn't do anything for me. So, basically, I just covered it up. I mean, they're making such a big deal out of it. The only reason I've untaped it here lately, because I guess got tired of answering questions about it. I mean, it's, you know what I'm saying? Just, anyway, they're getting advertising for free. I'm still putting in eight or 10 hours a day, typically. I mean, it's just, uh, we're, we're fishing in a week long event. I mean, and a lot of these guys are wearing themselves out before we even start the tournament. It's, uh, you know, going back years and years, I've noticed the tournaments I do the best are the ones I get the most rest on. And, you know, maybe that's because I'm already on the fish, I guess. So I'm a little more relaxed, but, uh, but yeah, the ones where I'm stressed out and work the hardest and for whatever reason, I just don't seem to do well in those times of ter types of tournaments. And uh, the other thing is, I mean, the conditions change hourly. So once you get a feel for, you know, what's going on, you know, basically you, you make the decisions on tournament day. The finding fish to catch is not hard dealing with the other anglers that are on your stuff is harder to me than uh, and you can't you can't make those decisions until you get out there on tournament day you know who's on this place who's doing that you know you get behind somebody and it really messes you up so uh the tournaments where i'm you know know what's going on but not really focused on one specific spot and just go fishing you know, usually is good for a 10 grand check and usually going to get you to the classic. To win an event, you typically have to be on one particular spot. Most tournaments are one spot fishing, but uh, 
but to actually find that spot and then get on it in the tournament, especially with my, you know, slower boat type of deal, it's, uh, it's, it'll get you burned. Those are usually my, I mean, I, sometimes I win or do really well doing that, but I also have some of my worst tournaments that way, you know, 90th place because I was too focused on one thing and it's really hard to get away from it. But, uh, but I don't know. There's, the main deal is, I mean, we're just in the last five, six years, I've had kids and so I try to spend an hour or two with them in the mornings and they, they can't go in the boat with me. That's, I mean, that's a big part of it. You know, up, up until five or six years ago, they could all, they could travel in the boat. They could go practice with you. So, you know, if I want to spend time with them, I got to do it on the bank. So that's the way it is. I mean. The rules suck, absolutely, positively suck the way they are right now. I, uh, I'm not giving my kids the same opportunity I had growing up, and uh, it bothers me, it bothers me bad. The biggest difference to me is I can't take him fishing with me in practice, which that's what I grew up doing was practicing with dad. I never could fish the tournaments, but mom worked for a hospital, so you know, she's on call and whatever, so basically we had to go with dad when he went to the lake, you know, me and my brother, I mean, I got two brothers and a sister, but yeah, me and my other brother would, uh, we went everywhere. We took our naps. We took our naps in the rod lockers and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, but yeah, it was, that's what I grew up doing. 1982, the year dad made the classic. Mom loaded up the Suburban with four kids and uh, drove us out west. So that's me fly fishing somewhere. I'm not sure where, but uh, but yeah, dad was supposed to uh, fly out there and drive back with her and he uh, qualified for the classic. So he uh, couldn't use his vacation time. So uh, <laughs> he canceled on coming out there with us and uh, so he could go fish the classic and then this is me and Julia painting crankbaits. They, uh, I'm pretty sure that's uh, putting an epoxy finish on there. They use a hairdryer to uh, get rid of the bubbles. The hairdryer, uh, the heat, you know, makes it more viscous, more liquid. I'm not sure what the word is, but uh, basically you get the, any air bubbles you got trapped in that clear coat. And then we got a uh, Tinker Toys for the uh, the rotation. You got the Tinker Toys hooked up to a, uh, should be a rotisserie motor there somewhere. So basically, so you could spin it so it wouldn't finish right. But yeah, that was just the first thing you could get your hands on. I still got that Tinker Toy set. The kids would play with it, but uh, <laughs> that's some good stuff there. But yeah, these are some of those old pictures of dad. I don't remember, that's saltwater fishing, shark. And then uh, I assume this is, when we started fishing professionally, we loaded everything we owned into storage. And uh, we actually lived out of a tent for a year, two years on tour. So uh, yeah, there's Louie, Julia. And uh, that tent ended its, it met its demise at, uh, Lake Okeechobee. We had a storm. It blew 30, 40 miles an hour one night and actually ripped holes where it was flapping. Oh yeah, you need to get Julia to tell you the tent stories. <laughs> you saw our RV now. <laughs> this is where we started and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to go back. And then we bought a truck camper there for a while. So uh, that's that one. But, uh, this is uh, my brother, Travis, dad, me. Travis fishes those uh, fishers of men. About the only time he can get out of the house is with his uh, in-laws, his father-in-law. So yeah, they win. They win about one every year. They've, uh, they go to the nationals pretty regular. They won the regional. He's got a little Triton he won. I mean, he's won a boat, and, but uh, he usually wins on uh, Where's the classic Hartwell? Uh -huh. He wins on Hartwell every time he fishes. 
And uh, that's probably our honeymoon. We actually uh, we actually went fishing a few days anyway. We uh, we flew out to uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, Yellowstone, went fly fishing. I mean, heaviest winning weight ever, one, one twenty-two fourteen. It's uh, that number has been beat by Elias at one thirty-two. But uh, you know, I I can't help but think I turned loose. They had a rule there where you know fish can't had to be hooked inside the mouth. So uh, I actually turned loose the biggest fish I'd ever caught to date, like a ten pounder, and uh, turned loose several more that were hooked just right there on the outside of the lip. But uh, but yeah, I always seem to think, you know, I probably would have beaten that 132 number with what I caught. But uh, but yeah, it was just absolutely incredible. The uh, practice was amazing. The, uh, the first day I actually went out and fished a little bit deeper places. I had, uh, I probably caught 60 bass before lunch and uh, came in with 20 pounds and was in 51st place. <laughs> Not even in the top 50 with 20 pound bag. And uh, so day two, I knew I had to step it up and I knew where some bigger fish were. So I went fishing for them and caught like 29 pounds. The, uh, at the very end of the day, I came back to a place where I caught some six pounders, which, you know, I had about a six pound average, but, but I knew there were some bigger fish there. And uh, the bait everybody was throwing was that Osprey. So I pulled in there throwing that big osprey up there and these fish would just come rolling out there and look at it, but they wouldn't hit it. So, you know, I'm sitting there looking for different baits and, uh, you know, before we went out there, I didn't own a swim bait. I mean, other than something like a sassy shed or something, but, uh, so yeah, I'd spent what, $3,000 on swim baits before the tournament even started. And, uh, we, uh, you know, you think of that being a lot of stuff, but I mean, that's just one bag of baits. It's not all that much. They're $25 a pop kind of deal. But uh, but anyway, I started digging through there and somewhere along the way, I had read an article about floating a Huddleston, like not reeling it, just letting it float out there like it's dead. And uh, so I tied on a floating hood and lobbed it out there and uh, it's sitting there and those fish, those big fish just collected underneath it. I mean, obviously there's 20 or more fish there and they just sitting there looking at it, but nobody would hit it. So I started trying to twitch it and different things and that oh, didn't work. I mean, they didn't jerk, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't eat it. So I finally started just reeling it real slow and steady and they got behind it and started reeling a little bit faster, a little bit faster and uh, Finally had one like, you know, five, 10 feet from the boat, like a nine pounder sucked on it and missed it. And uh, I didn't catch him and I only had 10 minutes, 15 minutes before I had to go in, but I got a bite from one of them. So the next day I had the, you know, that big number five HUD rigged up and I showed up at that spot at daylight, first, first stop. And uh, you know, it took me an hour or so, but I caught eight fish in the first hour there that were mid thirties, probably 35, 36 pounds worth. And, uh, you know, out of, you know, I, I had hooks on the top. I had hooks on the bottom. I had a hook toward the back and out of those eight fish, I think three of them were hooked out here. You know what I mean? So, uh, out of eight fish, I only kept five, but I, luckily the, you know, the eight pounders, choked on it kind of deal so uh but yeah that's the day some point in there oh i i caught about 35 36 there i turned around and i ran to the next point the next spot right there and my second cast i had one eight to ten pounds come up and choke it like six eight feet right out in front of me and i set the hook and broke my line and uh 
only one I owned, only HUD. But, you know, my other one floated. I had a floater and a number five. So, uh, so I lost the only bait I had in the boat. And uh, so I ran around the rest of the day throwing that bass trick, throwing that old Bass Pro that you're going to want to talk about here in a little bit, but uh, the XPS. But uh, but anyway, somewhere in there, Jeffrey's, I remember Jeffrey's caught up with me and uh, he's got a picture of me with like two six pounders on a balance beam kind of deal. I mean, some pretty cool stuff, but uh, but really the most of the day I didn't help myself at all. And then uh, coming back in, I stopped on that place where I broke my bait off. And uh, you know, it's midday, one, two o'clock. And I look down there and I see my bait on the bottom where he had spit it out and uh, fished it out with my rod tip, tied it on, and the second cast after that, I caught another eight pounder and called a six, which got me to, you know, whatever, I had 40 pounds and something, which is, uh, you know, just, I don't know if that's my biggest bag ever or not. I can't remember, but, uh, but the, pretty close. You said, uh, obviously, Paul Elias has it. Uh, ed edges you out. I mean, he's got one thirty-two. But you said you don't think that'll ever that'll be beat. Is that what you said? Or? I didn't say that. No, what I'm say saying at dinner. I what thought to, to I actually. Back, what does it take? Going to take for you? I mean, is that something that you want to get back? I yes, I would love to have that back. But I mean, you gotta. I mean, we don't get many opportunities, I and mean, we may only get one or two more opportunities in the next ten years that we go someplace you can do that. What I'm saying is. I had 122, but I turned away. I turned loose a 10 pound fish, you know? I mean, I you. you know, I could, I probably could have called up six pounds right there to get to 128. I turned loose eight pound fish, you know? I mean, I really think I actually caught more than that, but <laughs> they don't put an asterisk. He had to turn them loose, you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> so uh, it puts me way down the list, but I, you know, really feel like I caught that much or more and only had 20 pounds the first day, but uh. But no, those numbers are beatable. There's no question they're beatable. You just, you're gonna have to hit the right lake on the right peak. And, uh, you know, obviously Amistad was pretty impressive there for a while, but, you know, the lake came up 50 feet, flooding all kinds of, you know, wood and whatever. And so, yeah, it's not as, not anything like it, what it was. And uh, when we went back to Clear Lake the second time, it wasn't anything like it was the first time. I mean, Obviously, there's some big fish there, but yeah, you got to hit them. All these lakes go through cycles, so yeah, you got to hit them on a, a big cycle, and you know that's obviously not going to come up very many times. But uh, but yeah, I've, those numbers will be beat at some point. I have no doubt. <laughs>
Luckily, they were only a buck ninety-nine a piece instead of what eleven something they were asking before. So, uh, so yeah, I got three hundred of these things, and uh, the best color I've. Uh, there's probably only a dozen of them, and I'm, you know, I'm down to my last five, and they're all chewed all two pieces. I mean, they don't swim worth a two, but uh, but I've still got a few of them. And then there's some other colors I'm gaining a little bit of confidence in, just because I've been forced to throw them. But uh, oh, we've been working, I won't say we've been working hard. Kevin Short's been kind of prodding me to, uh, we gotta get another swim bait made. And we've actually got a prototype mold, but it, uh, it hadn't turned out quite the way I want. So uh, we're gonna be working on it some more this winter. and. Hopefully sometime next year, I'm gonna have a swim bait out that that I like, you know what I mean? I mean, we got something, but it's... So you didn't say what its name was for three, four years. You would say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, just, I, just, well, I mean, it, it became kind of... A a lot of people, obviously, every, I, I won't say everybody, but yeah, most people know what it is. It's just, I mean, they, they're not paying. That's the way this game works. You gotta get paid to talk about something, and if you're not, I mean. So it's not I'm, that you don't want people to not throw it, or is that it too? I mean, I mean that's part of it too. Yeah, you don't want to tell them everything you know. I mean, but anybody that anybody that follows the sport and talks to people knows what I'm throwing. I just I believe that. But it but, still pains you. I mean, just say the name of the bait and, and what it is. I mean, right. Without pains. yes, it's it's not something we want to talk about all that much. But anyway, I I mean, yeah, we're sitting here looking at all this stuff. I, I grew up out there, you know, jigging a spoon, dragging a Carolina rig, throwing a brig crankbait. I'm a deep water, open water guy. Is what I grew up doing. Now I'm known as a swim bait guy because I want it clear lake doing that and obviously I've used it a bunch since then. It's it definitely opened my eyes to some new stuff. So Do you think uh, that's kinda of funny? I mean what you know you're good at and what <laughs> What everybody else that knows that me as is, is, that, is that kind of funny to you? It is, yeah. It really but anyway, I'm obviously I'm good at that too. I've I've won more with a swim bait than I have out there thinking around i say that i've won twice on uh, kentucky lake kentucky lake's like the closest thing i've ever seen to lake eufaula where i you know we spent a lot of time on the lower end of eufaula down there so uh kentucky lake's just like the lower end of eufaula just without the standing timber to mess it up basically it's uh it's pretty incredible so i've won twice there and had some real more real good finishes i, I love it but uh but yeah, the swim bait is the other thing. There's there's certain strengths. There's certain things you've got to know as a professional angler. You got to know how to flip punch. You got to know how to throw a big crankbait. You know, to me, you got to know how to throw a swim bait now. I mean, but there's certain key techniques that win, and uh, and I'm not deficient at any of them. I'm. You know, I'm in the top ten on every one of those. I think maybe up. The one I don't do that much is the drop shot. What Aaron and them are doing, and uh, you know, it's. I mean, obviously, I catch fish doing it, but that's one I don't just pick up, and it's not my main deal. But, but as far as you know, punching it, Okeechobee, and big crankbaits on the Kentucky, and you know, the the big stuff. I'm pretty proficient at every one of them. Okay. Oh! 